This morning we are in Hebrews chapter 7. We're just really moving quickly through this book, but hopefully we're getting the big picture. Uh, Jesus is better in every way than all the mediators of the Old Covenant. Uh, he is God in human flesh. He is the only priest who can reconcile us to God. And that particular point is the point the author to the Hebrews is now developing. So let's begin by reading chapter 7. And actually, um, all the way, I believe, through chapter 10, we're going to, well, he's going to be unfolding more and more about the priesthood of Christ, but particularly this morning, that Jesus is a priest according to the order of Melchizedek, and that would be relevant to, to the Jewish people because in their understanding, you had to be of the tribe of Levi if you were going to be a priest. So he's going to set out to show us how the priesthood of Melchizedek is superior to that of Levi. So Hebrews chapter 7, let me read for you the 28 verses. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth part of all the spoils, was first of all, by the translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God. He remains a priest perpetually. Now observe how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the choice of spoils. And those indeed of the sons of Levi who received the priest's office have commandment in the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their brethren, although these are descended from Abraham. But the one whose genealogy is not traced from them collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. But without any dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater. In this case, mortal men receive tithes, but in that case, one receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives on. And so to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Now, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it, the people received the law... What further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be designated according to the order of Aaron? For when the priesthood is changed in necessity, there takes place a change of law also. For the one concerning whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no one has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning priests. And this is clearer still, if another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become such not on the basis of a law of physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life. For it is attested of him, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is a setting aside of a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. And on the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. And inasmuch as it was not without an oath, for they indeed became priests without an oath, but he with an oath through the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. So much the more also Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. The former priests on the one hand existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, 
who does not need daily like those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. Because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son made perfect forever. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing uh, this morning. Now, last week, we saw that the author to the Hebrews wanted to tell his readers more about Jesus Christ, particularly regarding his priesthood and the fact that it was of the order of Melchizedek. But he couldn't until he got their attention. Remember, the author to the Hebrews said they had become dull of hearing, which meant sluggish in their understanding and in their obedience. They should have been far more advanced in the faith than they were, but they weren't which is why they were in danger of abandoning Jesus Christ and going back to the old covenant shadows. They didn't really understand in the way they needed to understand, Uh, not just, of course, in their learning, but in in their spiritual sight of who Jesus Christ is. Uh, Once you see Him with spiritual eyes, once your heart is changed to see His glory, you don't want to go backwards. Well, to solve this problem, remember... He exhorted them to press on to maturity, to go beyond the basics, to grow up, to move from milk to solid food, by which he meant to know the Lord more intimately than they did, that they might love Him more, and that they might serve Him more fully. He also warned them, remember, the unpardonable sin. He warned them what would have happened or what would happen if they turned back after having experienced so much of the Spirit's ministry through the Word and in their conscience, that if they turned away from Christ now, it would, it would be impossible to renew them again to repentance if they sided with the Jews and said that Jesus Christ deserved to be crucified. And He encouraged them, on the other hand, that if they did press forward, if they continued to hold on to Jesus Christ and continue to strive, as it were, towards Him, that on the basis of what God has done, His promise, His oath, and the fact that it is impossible for God to lie, that He will never change and He cannot lie, they would arrive in heaven if they trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now again, the Lord says the same things to you to secure your future with Him as well, to fortify you in your resolve to hold on to the Lord and not to go back to the world from which He saved you, to press on to maturity, knowing that to turn from what He's already shown you might spell your end because remember, if you turn away from Jesus Christ, who is the only source of salvation, there is nothing left but judgment. If you turn away from Him, it could mean your destruction. It certainly will unless you turn back. But also knowing that if you will hold fast to Jesus Christ, He will bring you to heaven because God cannot deny Himself. He has promised and He will not take it back. Well, I think by now the author has their attention and now he's ready to move on to the subject that he began back in chapter 5. You need a priest if you're going to approach God, but only God can appoint one for you. But as a matter of fact, that is exactly what He's done. He's given to you the Lord Jesus Christ. The author goes on now to begin to demonstrate that Jesus Christ is a better priest, better than the Levitical priests because He is of the order of Melchizedek. Now, I've already mentioned Why does the author even need to deal with the particular priesthood of which Jesus is a part? Well, again, it's because of the question that was raised in the Jewish mind. How can Jesus be a priest if He is from the line of Judah and not from the line of Levi because it was only those who were of the tribe of Levi that could be priests and more specifically, they had to be sons of Aaron? Well, His answer is, there's another priesthood one that existed before Levi, one that is superior to Levi, and that is the order of Melchizedek. 
Now, this morning, what I want us to do is to consider two things. First of all, who Melchizedek is, and secondly, why his priesthood, according to the author to the Hebrews, is better, or more specifically, why Jesus is a better priest than any or all of the Levitical priests. So first of all, let's answer the question, who is Melchizedek? Well, the author gives to us several things about him. He says that he is the king of Salem. Salem was a city in the Old Testament. Salem, by the way, is the city that eventually would be called Jerusalem, interestingly enough. He was a priest of the Most High God, one who we would presume was offering sacrifices at that time for those who worshipped the true God, who met Abraham as he returned from the slaughter of the kings. By the way, I should just back up and mention, there were people worshipping God outside of Abraham's family. Well, as a matter of fact, there was for a time. The true faith uh, didn't get extinguished as soon as the Lord chose Abraham. There were others that survived the flood who actually lived contemporary with Abraham, but eventually they died off and the true religion died off and it was centered actually exclusively in the line of Abraham, but at this point, not yet. This priest met Abraham when he returned from the slaughter of the kings, as we saw, who blessed Abraham and to whom Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. The author says that this man was, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. That's literally what Melchizedek means. He was also the king of peace, uh, that is, being the king of Salem. The word Salem in Hebrew means peace. He was out without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he was a priest perpetually. Now again, who was this man? Now, at first glance, he appears to be a pre-incarnate uh, appearance of Jesus Christ and perhaps we would be tempted to think that that's exactly who he was. But I don't think that's what the author to the Hebrews is saying. As he's pointing out Melchizedek, I think he is switching between Melchizedek and Jesus. And yet, we'll also see that everything he says about Melchizedek is something that was true of Melchizedek, but it doesn't mean that he was Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to notice that the author to the Hebrews says that Melchizedek was made like the Son of God, and second, that the Son of God existed before He did. Now, how can one be made like the Son of God and be the Son of God at the same time? You would have to be two different individuals, and the fact that one is made like someone else means that that someone else has to exist before you. I hope that makes sense. Melchizedek is like him. He was made like him. He is not him. And notice the author also says in verse 15 that Jesus is another priest who has risen according to the order of Melchizedek, another besides Melchizedek himself. He is not Melchizedek. Some believe that he might actually be one of the um, survivors of the, uh, the flood, that he might be one of the patriarchs. I think some suggested that he might be Shem. We don't know exactly who he is. But we do know why the author to the Hebrews points to Melchizedek. He points to him as a picture, a type of the one who was coming who would rise in the same order that he was in, the one who would bring righteousness to his people, the one who is the king of righteousness, the one who would bring peace between us and God, the one who is the true king of peace, and the one who would be able to do that forever because He is also the eternal God who has been exalted to the place of absolute authority over all the earth. Now, as to the fact that Melchizedek himself had neither father nor mother, no genealogy, no beginning of days nor end of life, the author is simply telling us there that he isn't qualified to be a Levitical priest. To be in that priesthood, he would have to prove his lineage Melchizedek could not do that because he was not in the line of Levi. In other words, those references to not having this or that simply means there was no record of those things. He didn't have the necessary pedigree to serve in the Old Covenant system. 
And should we assume that Melchizedek is still a priest, as verse 3 seems to suggest that he is basically a priest perpetually? I don't think so. I think the author is simply telling us that the priesthood continues, uh, the Melchizedek, as it were, priesthood continues, but it continues from the other one who is risen according to that priesthood who is the Lord Jesus Christ. So who is Melchizedek? We don't know exactly, but we do know that he was a priest and that he was of a, of a priestly order that existed before Levi. Now, the important thing, though, for us to understand is what the author says next, and that is our second point. Why is this priesthood? Why is Jesus' priesthood, which is according to the order of Melchizedek, better than the Levitical priesthood? Well, the author actually gives us at least four reasons. First, because Melchizedek is greater than Levi, as we've already seen. Secondly, the fact that God instituted another priesthood means that the first one could not do what it set out to do. It cannot make you perfect. Thirdly, because Jesus appointed, uh, was appointed to the priesthood by oath, where the Levitical priests weren't. And then fourthly, my, my favorite one, because Jesus is indestructible and the Levitical priests were not. So let's look at these uh, briefly. First of all, Jesus' priesthood is better because Melchizedek is greater than Levi. Now, how do we know that? Simply because Abraham tithed to Melchizedek and Melchizedek blessed Abraham. Now, we've already read that in Genesis 14. When Abraham returned from rescuing Lot, Melchizedek met him with bread and wine. And uh, that's something that we might look at and say, wow, this... This person is like Christ in so many ways, and he brings out bread and wine of all things to, uh, to Abraham to refresh him. It looks almost like a prefiguring of the Lord's table, uh, and perhaps it was a picture of that. But Abraham gave him a tenth of the spoils, and Melchizedek blessed him. In the Old Covenant, we read that the Levitical priests were given a commandment by God to receive a tenth from the people to support them for their ministry on behalf of God's people. But Abraham, who is greater than Levi, since he is Levi's great-grandfather, actually paid tithes to Melchizedek. Now, the author points out that because of this, Melchizedek is greater than Abraham, but another thing he points out is that in a certain sense, because Levi had not yet been born, he's actually Abraham's, let's see, would be a great-great-grandfather, I think, uh, Levi was paying tithes to Melchizedek since he was still in the loins of Abraham. Therefore, Melchizedek is greater because he is a greater person. He is, as it were, an elder and an elder priest and one that actually collected tithes from Levi rather than paying tithes to Levi. Now, notice also that after receiving this tithe, Melchizedek blessed Abraham, and the author to the Hebrews points out in verse 7, but without any dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater. I mean, just look through the Old Testament. Look at when it came time for the patriarchs to die and they passed on the blessing of God's covenant to their offspring. Did the child or the son bless the father? No, it was the father blessing the child or the son. The lesser is always blessed by the greater. By the way, that's, the why, that's one of the reasons why the fifth commandment exists and why uh, as children, we are to honor our parents because they are greater than us, and we are to honor our elders. Now, if Melchizedek blessed Abraham, Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. But since Abraham is greater than Levi, since he is his great-grandfather, Melchizedek is also greater than Levi. Well, Jesus is a priest according to the order of Melchizedek, and so he is a better priest because he is greater. Now, secondly, Jesus is a better priest because he was able to do what the Levitical priesthood could not do. I mean, the fact that God instituted another priesthood, the author to the Hebrews argues, means that the first could not get the job done. It wasn't enough to reconcile you to God. And he's going to go on to show why that is in the, uh, the next chapters, but he says in verse 11, 
Now, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be designated according to the order of Aaron? Why did God bring another priest outside of the priesthood of Aaron if the priesthood of Aaron could actually do the job? Well, the reason is because they couldn't. They didn't have the ability to reconcile us to God. They were only a picture of the one who actually could. But this priest who arises from the order of Melchizedek actually does get the job done. He actually does reconcile us to God through his obedience, through his death on the cross. He is the only source of salvation, the only door to God, and so he is a better priest. I would say that that's better, wouldn't you? The fact that he's actually able to do what God appointed him to do. By the way, I wanted to just go aside for just a moment here and point out something that I was actually speaking with, with Sarah about recently and something that we, we need to understand. The author to the Hebrews points out that when God changes the priesthood, he also, as a matter of fact, must change the law at the same time, the law regarding the priesthood. What this means is he has changed the ceremonial law because the ceremonial law required that they be of a certain tribe. This one comes from a different tribe. God has to change the law in order for this to happen. God has actually fulfilled or Jesus has actually fulfilled the ceremonial law. And that's the law that the author to the Hebrews is referring to here. It was fulfilled and done away with by the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, Jesus is of the tribe of Levi, or not of the tribe of Levi, but from the tribe of Judah, which Moses said nothing about with regard to priests. You cannot be a priest and be from that tribe. So the law has changed. Now, I wanted to point that out simply because so many churches use verse 12 with regard to this change of law, the setting aside of this law, uh, to say that the moral law has actually been changed or done away with, but it hasn't. And you do not want to look at this verse and read that into it, for when the priesthood is changed of necessity, there takes place a change of the law. That's the ceremonial law that actually governed who could be a priest. If you're going to have a priest from the tribe of Judah, there has to be a change of the law. The law actually has changed. The ceremonial law has been done away with. It's been fulfilled by Christ, but not the moral law. Jesus says about the moral law in Matthew 5, verses 17 through 19, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Whenever somebody challenges you and, and tries to convince you that we don't have to keep the Ten Commandments, Remember what our Lord Jesus Christ said, whoever keeps and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Paul says the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. He tells us in Romans chapter 13 that love is the fulfillment of the law, that it's teaching us that we must love. As a matter of fact, the author to the Hebrews is going to tell us it's this law that God puts in your minds, the law that was written on stone the Ten Commandments. He puts it in your mind and He writes it on your hearts in the New Covenant. That is the blessing of the New Covenant that gives you the power to do what God calls you to do, to love Him and to love your neighbor as yourself. And the fact that you do love that law and the fact that you do love God and the fact that you do love your neighbor is the evidence that you've actually been born again and that you're a part of this New Covenant. So the Levitical priesthood and the ceremonial law were set aside, he says, because they were weak and they were useless. They weren't able to make you perfect. But Jesus can because He is a better priest. 
So Jesus is better because Melchizedek is greater and because he's actually able to do what God ordained the priest to do in the first place. But thirdly, another reason Jesus is better is because he was appointed to this office by God, by oath. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Now, apparently, when God instituted the Levitical priesthood, he didn't swear an oath. And that didn't mean that the priesthood was not what he wanted it to be. It doesn't mean that they weren't doing what he wanted them to do. It was still a valid ministry. But the fact that he ordained Jesus to the priesthood with an oath that he swore you are a priest forever, where the Levitical priests were not, means that Jesus is preferred. He is a better priest. And then finally, Jesus is a better priest because he is indestructible. Levitical priests, on the other hand, aren't indestructible. The Lord says to him, you are a priest forever. He never said that to the Levitical priests. The Levitical priests were actually prevented from continuing to minister on behalf of God's people because they died. But Jesus, being indestructible and having neither beginning of days nor end of life, who holds his priesthood permanently, is able to save forever those who draw near to God through Him because He always lives to make intercession. So Jesus is a part of a priesthood that is greater than that of Levi. He got the job done, whereas the others could not. He was ordained to this work by an oath of God, and being indestructible, He can do this forever. Jesus is a better priest. Now, applying this, of course, to the point the author to the Hebrews is making is, remember, you and I need a priest if we're going to approach God. There's no other way to do it. If you are to be saved, you need a priest. Well, God has only ever appointed two priesthood, and that is that of Levi and that of Melchizedek, not Levi and the Roman church, not Levi and any other, uh, you know, men who would claim to be priests. There is only those two orders. Now, he's already pointed out the Levitical priests can't do it. They cannot make you perfect. They are weak and they are useless, especially because the Lord has done away with them. They're no longer an option for us, as we've seen. But Jesus can do it if you will turn away from your sins and trust in Him. The Levitical priests continually, the author to the Hebrews says here in closing, had to offer sacrifices for their own sins before they could offer a sacrifice for yours. He already brought that up in chapter 5. But Jesus offered one sacrifice for all time that is able to remove all of your sins and make you perfect if you will simply believe on Him. The Levitical priests could not continue their ministry because they died. But Jesus will never die. He always lives to make intercession for you. He pleads continually His merits, the merits of His work, the merits of His shed blood on your behalf if you receive Him. And as we saw, the ceremonial law appointed men who were weak, but God's oath appointed a son who was made perfect forever and one who can make you perfect. Jesus is a better priest, Jesus is a far better priest because He is able to bring you all the way to God if you will simply trust Him this morning. Now, if you haven't, let this be a reminder to you of what the author to the Hebrews has already said. There is no other way to God. He is the only source of life because He is the only priest who can actually reconcile you with the Father. If you haven't trusted Jesus Christ, you must or you will perish. Realize that Jesus is the only way and realize the infinite love of God, that He is willing to offer His Son to you week after week after week. Don't take that for granted because the author to the Hebrews just warned us there could come a time when the Lord will stop offering His Son to you. You don't want that to happen. Receive the Lord Jesus Christ, trust in Him, and He will reconcile you with His Father. You will be saved. 
Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a few moments of silent prayer and let's ask the Lord again to help us take what we've heard and apply it by His grace so that we might be encouraged, those of us who have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, to know that He is able to bring us all the way, to know that we have a better priest who can get the job done and who will be able to do it forever. And if we haven't, that the Lord would give us grace, He would open our eyes and help us to trust this one who alone can save us. Let's pray.